Welcome everybody to your Bronx Sports Jedi MMA weekly program here in the Bronx Sports Sports Jedi Network. I'm Austin and my co-host tonight, Chef Dan. First of all, how are you doing tonight, Chef Dan? Salute to you, Austin. Hope you're doing well. Hope everything's doing well with you and your family. I'm doing well myself, man. I, I enjoyed the weekend. We had some uh, good fights, some interesting conversations after the fight. I think the the conversations were more interesting than the fights, and they're gonna have our uh, imaginations running. So we'll get into that tonight. But how are you? Uh, I'm doing doing pretty good. Doing all right. You know, good. You know, solid day. Can't complain. Although I pressed the old intro, my bad. But hey, it is what it is. We're all human. But hey, it is. But anyway, um, yeah, good day. I'm excited for um tonight. You know, also you can watch this, listen to us on podcast platforms: Anchor FM, Spotify, Popping, Reason FM, and Buzzsprout, etc. Also, if you know if you're busy at work, and you don't want YouTube to drain your battery and phone. You can listen to us on these platforms as well. So I want to shout that out as well. And don't forget the Bronx. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I say don't forget the Bronx Sports Jedi merch store, which we do have here. You know, you can get these shirts and other and other um and other shirts and other other shirts and other merch on on our on our website, Bronx Sports Jedi. And I believe it's a QR code, if I'm mistaken. Most definitely. If you're watching on the YouTube uh, channel right now, if you look up top on the uh, screen, there's a QR code. So if you, you know, watching on your laptop, you just take your phone out, you scan the QR code, it takes you directly to the merch store. There you can cop some of the, you know, latest uh, Bronx Sports Jedi Network swag right here. You know, we got some good shirts. Uh, also got the Knicks stuff right here. Got Obi right. Toppin slamming it down. So that's some good stuff right there. Definitely, most definitely. Yep. Anyway, um, so yeah, let's get on the show. First, I I'll start with um Anthony Joshua. I know you want to start off there. Yeah, most definitely. I want to start off there because uh, he had some interesting comments uh, this this weekend. He kind of, you know, just uh, he put his fans on tilt with these comments. He kind of let us know what he's thinking and where he's at in his uh, mentality. He he let us know that he's done with losing and that he's done trying to learn the sweet science of boxing. He said he's put it all together now and he's rolling with it. If you like it, come watch. If you don't, don't watch. Whether the refs like his style or not, he might get thrown to the floor in the next fight because it's war. Boxing is good, but when it comes to 12-round cha- championship fights, it's mad. I'm, I'm heading into my 12th world, uh, 12th world title fight now, and the learning's done. It's war. It's straight war. I'm annoyed. I'm boiling up even speaking about it. I started firing up a bit. It's that passion to win, and I love a challenge. He goes on to say things like, you know, he promises murder and that it is a war for him. Um, man, the first thing I, 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 I the first thing I want to say is like it, it's about damn time. This is the mentality he should be having. It, it shouldn't be studying every single fight. The time to study is during your your fight your training camp. That's it. 
that's really what I want to say. Like, it's about damn time. Like, you are a heavyweight in boxing. At any moment, it can be lights out for you. And you're you're so focused on trying to fight the perfect fight every fight. It's it's visible right there in his fighting style. And that's the problem. Like the, the reason why you, you see Anthony Joshua and everyone is so annoyed with him is because you can clearly see the talent. The issue is he's not accessing the full 100% of that talent. And so we'll see on the next use check fight. I don't even want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to stick on this topic too much. He's annoying. This is what's annoying about him. So we'll, we'll just move on to the to the cost of a Tory fight for now. It, it's about damn time. That's all I want to say. It's about damn time. Okay, yeah, we'll go switch to MMA now. And you mentioned this past weekend we did have a UFC card in Vegas. And the main event was Paul Costa versus Marvin Tory. I like him weight, not when he fought originally because Paul Costa couldn't make weight. And then they, they moved up to catch weight, 185, and you go see side for the heavyweight. And... In this fight, where Arnold Vittori gets a victory, 48-46 at all three judges' scorecards. Now, 46 is because they're, Paul Costa was ducked at point in the second round for for an eye poke. And that's why instead of 48-47, it's 48-46. Although he won that round, I think, of all three judges' scorecards. And this was a pretty entertaining fight. I mean, this was so exciting. This fight was, I mean, this fight was back and forth. It was action-packed. They both were hitting each other with some shot with you know, big shots. You know, there were times where they stung each other, and Marvin's toughness really showed in this fight. I mean, he survived some nasty body shots, where he kicks, punches, etc., and even kicks to the head, and yet he still survived. He was able to hurt Paulo Costa as well, and you know, hit you know, target him, and even take him down, and get him up, you know, again top position, and even the fourth round after Paul had did to him the dirt round, the end of the dirt round. Or four, I forget which round, but I know one round Paul got on top of him, took him down, then the other round Marvin took him down, and they were both, you know, ground and pound stuff, trying to hurt each other. And this was just, this was, I, I love this fight. This fight was incredible. And congratulations to Marvin Torrey. Marvin Torrey, what a performance, showing toughness, skill, and guts. I mean, Marvin Torrey gained a lot of new respect from a lot of fans, and, and gained a lot of fans as well after this past week. I mean, I mean what are your thoughts on this fight, Dan? Um, this fight was very, very good. I, I agree with you there in the sense like both of these guys came within reason. Like they needed to put on the show for a reason, especially after like all the shenanigans that happened prior to the fight, leading up to the fight. Like it it had to it had to be a show because Marvin Vittori, he let us know that he was angry, he was upset, he felt disrespected, and so he had to show that in the ring. This is the one job where if you don't like your co-worker, you can punch them in their face. So you can, you know, it. he can do that, and he took full advantage of that. Paulo Costa had to put on a show because if he didn't, this possibly could have been the last fight in the – his last fight in the UFC. After not making weight, like, multiple times, multiple times, not only just in, in this fight – it within, uh, you know, not multiple times just within this fight, but throughout his career, he's already had problems with weight. But then in this fight, you know, you can't make the 185. So now you agree to a catch weight of 195. You can't make the 195. So now they have to bump it up to 205. So if Israel Adesanya watches this fight and says, this does nothing for the division, he has a gripe with it. But both of these guys put on a show, not to take away from, you know, the weight shenanigans. Both of these guys really did put on a show. Um, even if you, you know, wanted to add in the point that was taken away from the earlier uh, earlier round due to the eye poke from Paulo Costa, I, I still say Marvin Vittori won this fight convincingly to me. Yep. It was, you know, it was a different it was a different Marvin Vittori completely. This guy, he did not want to wrestle at all. It was stand up and strictly punch you in the face and do all the damage I can while we're standing up. I, I don't want to take it to wrestling. And the only time he did wrestle, honestly, was about 45 seconds left in the fifth round. He grabs uh, Paulo Costa into a clinch and kind of just holds him there to secure the victory because... 
that's what I, you know realistically after the fight that's what i wanted him to do you know watching the fight it would have been nice to, for him to get a, a, a firework finish but realistically you just get out of there with the win you get out of there with the extra money from the purse due to the missed weight and you kind of get out of there with your pride intact saying hey I, I went in there letting you guys know I was going to win the fight standing up. I wasn't going to wrestle at all. And that's how he went about it. Paulo Costa, kudos to him because he, he still had his weapons and he was using them out there. His jab was very effective, but the kicks were much, were much more effective. Um, in the third and fourth round, he tried wrestling a little, but then realized that Marvel Vittori was having none of it and wanted to stand up. And it even lended into his fifth round approach of trying to get a knockout. But Marvin Vittori was smarter to it, more hipper to it, and won the fight. So it, convincingly a, a good fight for Marvin Vittori all around. And really uh, the, the, surprising, the surprising thing to me is, you know, Paulo Costa's people said that he was moving to a uh, light heavyweight. But before that, the news came out that Dana White officially announced that he was moving to light heavyweight. So Dana White being done with the shenanigans of the weight um, of the weight issues with Paula Costa and forcibly moving the athlete to another uh, to another division. That was surprising to me because I feel like some athletes do need that, but it is truly up to their own discretion. Part of being a fighter is having the freedom to fight in that weight class. So that was interesting to me, Austin. How would you see that? Uh, well. It was kind of surprising because, you know, Dana White said that because, you know, you know, Paul's custom has had some trouble making weight. This was, I think, the first time he made what, miss weight. Maybe, well, technically he didn't miss weight, but you get what I mean. But, um, right, and, you know, and plus, I think maybe the whole antics lean up to the week, the, the, the whole week to lean up to the fight, kind of just rub, you know, rub a lot of people the wrong way. You know, a lot of MMA media, you know, MMA media, fans other fighters and Dana and rub Dana White the wrong way. So Dana White says, screw it. I'm just gonna go out. You know what? My step doing the shenanigans again, I'm just gonna go up, you know, make you go up on two oh five then instead of doing this, you know, shenanigans again. Cause I know him and Paulo were having some issues prior to this this you know, last week. I forget what it was, but they were having those issues. And yeah, so yeah, and at this Dana White set up, you know, Dealing the same issues with him missing, making making weight, he's just have, just having bump up to two hundred five. I think that's what it is. And also, I want to give Paulo some credit because in that in that first round, Paulo looked tired, he looked gas, look, he was like almost gonna be exhausted. But that second round, he he, you know, he won that round. Well, he's a tight that went around because I poke. And in that fifth round, I mean, he really was hurting for Tori going for the finish. And I want to give him credit there. But yeah, I mean, it is kind of surprising, but I get why Dana White did it. So, I mean, I can't, I can't really fault Dana at all. I mean, but this is, and this is where uh, I, I say the speculation is more interesting than the fight. Excuse me. You have a you have a, a Apollo Costa who, I'm guessing Dana White doesn't want to lose because. His antics truly did turn a lot of people off on the fight. Like, I watched the card, but it wasn't much to speak about to me personally. There were some great performances, but overall, the card wasn't, you know, it wasn't enticing to me. Though this fight was, it, and it, this fight ended up surprising me. And that's what I can say about this fight, is it ended up surprising me. But Having a Paulo Costa that, you know, he technically doesn't want to lose, right? Because he is still a talent. Like, regardless of the weight shenanigans he pulled before this fight, he was able to put on a product that was good over the weekend. And so my question is, will this be the last time we see Dana White exercising his power to say, hey, to, to a fighter, exercising his power to a fighter to say, hey, you're no longer in this weight class. You're either moving up or I'm not I'm not using you as a fighter anymore. It won't be the last time. It'll happen again. We don't know when, but it'll probably happen again with some other fighter. It probably will. I, I, I won't be surprised. I mean, we see a guy in uh, Davison Figueredo, for instance. 
Right. Oh, good point. Yeah, good good point. He while he like his championship run was impressive. Yeah. He really took on all challengers and even like having that good fight with Brandon Moreno at, at you know at, at the end of uh two years ago. That was impressive because he was able to defend the title so many times during that during the pandemic year. And so like Having that type of talent, do you tell him after this fight with uh with uh Brandon Moreno if he loses this like you know, hey you're not in this division anymore? I'm moving you up. May yeah, I mean it depends. I mean if he if he struggles making the way and maybe he loses, yeah, but who knows? It's something we gotta see. Obviously, what happens when they do fight. But this is the thing. Like this is with a fighter who, I mean. Davison is the first thing that comes to my mind as far as like a, a an athlete who consistently makes trouble, who has trouble making the weight. But I'm pretty sure there's other guys who, you know, are, are very talented, but we know they have trouble with the scale. That's the one thing that's beating them. And so it even affects their performance. And we don't want to see that guy hampered. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Or uh, hopefully it could turn around. Like Mackenzie Dern, if you remember, was having trouble making 115, but then she recently turned around and was able to. Now she makes weight usually on point and still go on perform. You know, despite her losing her last fight, but before that she was on a roll. We get what I mean, though. Aspen Lad. Mm -hmm. I I know Kevin Lee made the move himself, but let's say Kevin Lee was stubborn. Yeah, good point. Like, these are interesting points. And so these are just uh, some things I wanted to uh, point out to the crowd, uh, point out to the chat, and just have them think about it. Robert Parr, salute to you. I see you in the chat. Always supporting, man. Salute and love, brother. I hope everything's doing well with you and your family. You know, Same. Nick's just got a solid win tonight, man. Hope you're doing well. Enjoy that. C celebrate that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So let's see, Robert. Robert, thank you for watching us and, and watching us live. We appreciate your support. And everyone's watching us right now, whether we'll you live or later on after this video is uploaded, after we're done recording. Thank you guys for watching us. Thank you guys for watching us. Most definitely. Salute to the Philippines. You guys always show love to the Bronx Sports Jedi Network. Like, salute to you guys over in the Philippines. You know, I, I, I know it's early right now. So you guys are asleep later on. You guys want to watch the, uh, the videos, but salute. Uh, y'all always show support. Salute and just check out the podcast format. I know y'all working and it, 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 YouTube kills the phone battery sometimes. Just check out the podcast format. It, it, so it's easy and it's dope and it, it's fun. But um, yeah, let's move on to um, Bellator where they had a very interesting fight. Very, oh, yeah. very interesting fight. They did. Fedor versus Tim Johnson. And this ended in the first round. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I, Austin, you take it away, man. You you you're cheesing right now. Yeah. You're cheesing. Like, you had fun with this fight. Tell me, tell fight, me what you saw. This fight had a lot of drama and action going in this. You know, in the three minute, in the couple minutes that was ended, because there were moments where Tim Johnson did hit, did connect with Fedor, and you're kind of like wondering, oh no, it's gonna get dropped, but Fedor survived, and then. It was, you know, there, Johnson was moving forward, but then Fedor moved forward, and then Fedor was, you know, back near the cage, not on the cage, but near it, and Fedor hits him this combination out of nowhere, and his fast hands, and it just drops, it just drops um, Jim Johnson back. I mean, Jim Johnson goes night, night, you know, night, night like that. It was like, oh, what? And then it was impressive because it was another first round finish for Fedor. I'm trying to remember, that's his. It's twenty something first round finishes Fedor Fedor's had in his career. He's got a lot of first round finishes. Now, granted, fighting in Japan, the first round was ten minutes over there in Japan and stuff, so it was a little bit different. But still, that's a lot. Of, it's a lot of finishes in the first ten minutes of of your of a fight, which is pretty damn impressive when you think about it. And Fedor, one of the things he always had was fast hands. Even back in the day, his, his fast were hand, his, I mean, his hands were fast. Excuse me. And he was always be always one of the faster heavyweights, and his speed's a lot of times shown in this fight. In this fight, and where he looked like he was the faster guy against Tim Johnson, despite being nine years older than him, 
but the speed was still there, and speed kills, as the old saying says. If you have good speed, you can avoid getting, especially in heavyweight, you can avoid getting a big shot. You can come in and catch heavyweights off guard, and I feel like that's what he did with Tim Johnson. He caught him off guard, him with a three-punch combination, and finished with the right hook, and just dropped him, and he, and he was done. And it was just like, oh, sh oh, he's done? Oh, dang. Okay. All right. All right, Fedor. And then, um, Fedor, and, um, yeah, and it was a big victory because this was Fedor fighting his home country in Russia and Moscow, too. He hadn't been, he hadn't been in Moscow in, like, like, nine years, like, nine years, so the Russian people seeing their hero, Fedor, who's, like, a big celebrity over there, get, get another victory. What well, might be his last fight. I'm not saying it is, but he did, uh, last, in it, last week in the Area Hawaii show, he did say it could, might be his last fight. So, I mean, be, you know, so seeing him get a victory, uh, you know, his potential last fight, or at least maybe his last fight in Russia from his, you know, his people, that's, that was kind of a cool sight to see, especially especially knowing that this could be the last one, last, last, his last dance. I, oh, man. This was very impressive. This was... This victory showed you why certain names are just immortal in the game. There are certain people. Oh, man. Is this his last fight? He said it might be an Aaron Wine show. But I is think. this his last fight? Who knows? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I is this his last fight? I, I the only thing I can ask is, is this his last fight? Because you have a guy who clearly right now he, oh man, he yeah you you have a guy who beat you you have a guy in Fedor who just beat a guy in Tim Johnson who granted he's. He's on the skid right now, but he 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 just you know he he lost to uh Valentin Moldovsky, but he just recently won like he just recently won against Czech Congo, and we spoke about how impressive Czech Congo is and how he's still doing his thing. Like, it is this Fedor's last fight, and the reason why I keep asking that question is because he looked like. He looks like one of those new age heavyweights. He, but he's always had this type of style of fighting, being quick, having the heavy hands. You know he can take you down, but he'd rather knock you out. Like in great use of the octagon, great use of footwork. He's dodging and weaving. He can take a punch, but that, you know, stay in the pocket long enough to give one back, give a few more back. And, you know, if it hurts you more, that's all he was looking for. He knows the exchange is there. Like, is this his last fight? I like, I, I don't, I don't know what to say, man. I don't know either. Yeah. Wait, can I ask you a question now? Hey, yeah, go ahead. Would Fedor have been as dominant as he was if, if he was in the UFC? Yeah, because here's the thing that people don't talk about. The UFC heavyweight division back in the days was not a great division at all. It really wasn't until like really the 2013-ish and they bought the Strike Four guys over. Because for a long time, heavyweight division, yeah, yeah, a couple of guys, but it was never that deep. It, it never was at the time. It was always Strike Pride and then Strike Force for a while had the better heavyweight. So, you know, Fedor Prime, you can make argument was 2006, like, you know, like 05, like, you know, like his peak peak was like, what, 05 to like 08 ish, 09. By that time, he was like 29, like 33 at that point. And he, he had guys like Tim Sylvia and Arthur Olaski down with the heavyweight division. And those are two guys he ended up being up, being, in no way, you know, back to back in affliction. When I was a company back in the day, and also you know his his rival, well his Antonio Harrigo Nogueira Minotaro won the, the interim heavyweight championship, and he ended up being and he beat him twice in Pride, and then Frank Mir was there, and you now granted you know granted Frank Mir they fought well they both were older when they fought each other Frank Mir he knocked out Frank Mir, so I mean yeah because a lot of the top heavyweights at the time 
were at the time the UFC from like that period, he ended up beating up them, beating them anyway. He didn't even fought Randy Couture. I still think he would be in Randy Couture. I think he would just use his sombre background and maybe you know and keep and keep the fight standing because he has better standing than um better stand up than Randy Couture back in my opinion. Just watching both guys fight. So yeah, to me he would have done well in the UFC. Okay, so then here's my next question. Do you think the tap, like, knowing who Dana White is, do you think the talent gap would have stayed as large as it was? No, nah, it would not nah, would close because Cain Velasquez, Junior Santos, those two guys were there. And, and then, you know, well, I was going to say Mark Hunt, but I don't remember. He beat Mark Hunt in Pride. He beat Mark Hunt, yeah. In, like, 06, yeah, last Pride fight. But, yeah, like Kane and um, Junior Santos, you know, would have definitely been interesting fights. You know, if he was still in the UFC, let's let's say he went to the UFC, it's still there and did well. Because those guys could have given him some problems. You know, especially, you know, different problems, but still. And then maybe, you know, Cormier, who knows? Because, you know, Cormier, you know, our family back in the day used to be known as Black Fedor. That was his nickname because he was small, small heavyweight speed, just like Fedor. So, I mean, I mean who knows? I mean, it would, it would close. Maybe one of them might beat him. Probably. More likely, yeah, I think he would have. Well, one of them would eventually beat him. Probably. Because eventually he was going to lose. I mean, he lost to Verdum, which at the time was a major upset. But then you see what Verdum became. And things like... Hindsight's kind of like, well, Verdun is pretty great himself, and he's got great jiu-jitsu, especially off his back. I mean, that's how he's able to get Fedor. Fedor was trying to ground and pound him, called Fedor, made him tap. And then, and then, you know, Verdun went on, you know, become the UFC heavyweight champion. You know, I mean, King Velasquez tap out. Most definitely. Um, next question I want to ask, man. Prime Fedor. Versus Prime Steep A. Oh, that's the bay because that's the two great heavyweights in MMA. That's that's be the that been, That's a great question. That that would been. How do you think that goes? That's a because Steep A is probably the it's the better stand up fighter with his boxing, and Steep has got wrestling, but I think Fedor grappling is better just because of um the Sambo background and things and. And once Fedor got took guys down, got on top of them, it was dangerous because he he arguably has the greatest ground and pound in MMA history. Him and Habib are like the two best. If you ever watched their watch Fedor on ground and pound, he was it was that it was dangerous. It was deadly what he used to do, guys, because he would use he used, he would use um both hands to you know attack his opponents. Where guys you you sometimes primarily use one hand one arm. So I mean, yeah, I don't know, man. That's. That's a tough, that's a pick 'em fight because I can see both because Prime Fader, Prime Stipe. It is it, a pick 'em. I know people say, "Well, how can you say that?" Well, that's because Fedor and Prime was pretty damn good. Great grappling, good stand up, speed. Yeah, tr- a lot of these things would translate him on UFC heavyweight division. If he was that's... ten years younger, mm-hmm. it would have. A lot of it would have. You know, and especially you know, people who say Steve Bay would just roll or Fedor, or people who have never watched Fedor fight. That's what, that's kind of a silly statement. Especially if you haven't gone back and watched those fights in Japan or even strike or even his debut fight in Strike Force or Affliction or whatever. Fedor had he always had you know Fedor has always been great. That that's not take away from Steve Bay because I think Steve Bay is good enough to where he could beat Fedor if they were full in the prime. I mean, but like let's 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 match make that right now. Let's discuss that right now. Does that go five rounds? No. Shock, it'd be shock if it goes five rounds. It, uh, okay. So it doesn't go five rounds. Where does it stop? Where What's the lo- what's the lengthiest amount of time you're giving it? 20, 20 minutes? Like we're in the fourth round, fifth round? Yeah, you know what? It could go five rounds because Mirko Karkov Fader went five rounds. I mean, not five rounds, but with the full distance and pride. It, they didn't have five rounds back prior. They, they're, 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 there was a difference. They had 25 minutes, but it was first round 10 minutes, second round 10 minutes, third round 5 minutes. Yeah, but, you know, we, we know they had the gas tank. We know they yeah. had the gas tank to go, to go 25. Yeah, yeah, and that fight in the decision, which, 
you know, you think Fader or Miracle would have been if someone that been stopped, but that wasn't the case. So it's possible Steve Bain Fader could have been twenty five. Okay. So there is a possibility it goes five rounds. Right. But we both say we both agree it's not like chances are it doesn't go it doesn't end five it doesn't end in five rounds right yeah right because Fedor is at, at like all right we both know the first round they're gonna dance around try to get into range but Fedor is really gonna initiate getting into the range first. Stepe is gonna Stepe has enough hand and enough stand up game to kind of strike with him to kind of back him up a little. Fedor is going to have to find a way to get him surprisingly, you know, backing up things of that nature, things of that nature. Right. Right. So let's end the first round there. Standing up. We give Fader the 10-9. The right. He was more active. He was getting more into the range. Right. OK. Second round. Man, I, don't, I, I can't believe we're talking hypothetical, a hypothetical matchup here. Uh, second round. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Second round. Fedor is, uh, he's going to consistently do the same thing. So now Stipe goes for a shoot. Does he get it the first time? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, he he might shoot. Get it. He's got good wrestling, Stipe. He's underrated, but still. Okay, so he shoots. He doesn't get the takedown, but they go into a clinch. They press up against the clinch, right? Right. Who's got better handwork there in the clinch? <sighs> wow. I'm going to go, I guess, Fedor. I, no, no. Mm. no. I don't know. I don't know. No, because. Ladies and gentlemen, wait, 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 wait. Before you go, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you, this is how we get in the breakdown the MMA game right here. It's details to this. Yeah, no, because I'm thinking the, steep, the DC fight. Remember the first DC fight? They got in the clinch and DC just knocked him out like that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of that. That's that's why I'm, that's why I want me to talk Fedor, but I'm like, well, maybe not. But okay, so then wait, do you consider Stepe's prime before the, the 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 DC fight or after? During it, his prime was no, it was during that time. You know, Stepe. You know, from you want to say after the Junior Santos loss in 2014, that like back and forth fight to like to now, uh, you can consider that his prime, Stepe. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, he lost to DC, but DC is one of the all-time greats. Yeah, he meant that loss twice. He beat DC twice after that. Most definitely, and actually, the second time, truthfully, I think DC kind of gave up early. Really? I think the second time DC had a chance to get out of there. I think his train, his approach to training camp was all wrong. I think he um, he came in heavier for no reason. He should have came in the same weight. I think he he knew it was his last fight, and he prematurely went out. I I, I think DC had a chance to kind of go back in there and make it a fight. Okay, uh, I, okay, uh, I... but that's you know that's my opinion. But let's get back to it. Who's got better hands in the clinch, Fedor, Prime Fedor, or Prime Stipe? I am. No, I don't know. Okay, like let's it. let's. All right, you know what? They go back and forth. We don't decide that the second round, right? They're going mm -hmm. back and forth. Stepe comes out of the clinch, but he's you know been landing some shots. He comes out. He gets a nice combo. Boom, boom. Fedor reels a little. He tries to go back in. Does he get the second takedown? He probably would. If he rocks him, yeah, he could. If he rocks him, okay. Yeah. Now he's on top. If Stepe's on top, does he win? Does he win that uh, that round convincingly? Yeah, yeah, he can. He can. Yeah, and he can stay on top throughout the throughout the round. Like, let's say this happens two thirty. He, yeah, I think he can for all, for a little bit. I think Fedor will at least be working and try to get out, scramble, get out, or even reverse position, probably at least. But I, think, but I think Steve is good enough to where he can still win the round. Even if Fedor got up, he still could win the round because it was takedown rocking him and down and pound. And Steve is good enough to do that. Okay, so they tied 1-1 going into the third round. How do you think Fedor attacks that now? I honestly don't know because he might try to get both, you know, try to you know, hurt Steve, maybe get too. 
you know, when he tries to, you know, try to head on, maybe a little bit, if he tries to head on Steve, just counter him, probably knock him out if he does that. Or he's just facing, you know, you know, maybe just does try to do a body shot or try to grapple himself, initiate. Maybe then he can um, hurt Stipe. Maybe then he can steal around from Stipe. He tries to initiate the grappling himself. And what's Stipe's approach uh, basically throughout this round? The same thing, right? Yes. Go, go straight to the wrestling. Go to the wrestling, but he needs to be careful because Fedor can. Because Sambo, one of, the, one of the aspects of it is judo. And judo, if you know judo, they use your momentum against you. He could flip it all of a sudden, Stipe. Next thing you know, Stipe's on bottom, and that's the danger for him. It's something that you got to take into account. Okay, so then we'll we'll leave it at that with there. We'll ask that uh, that question to the chat. You know, who do they think wins in a heavyweight uh, title matchup in the UFC? A prime Stipe versus a prime Fedor? You guys tell me five rounds, both of them in their prime. Who do y'all think wins that? Who who takes home the gold? With that, I want I want to uh, get right into to what's going on this Saturday. I'm very interested this Saturday. They giving this one away for for damn near for free unless you you know you pay for uh, ESPN Plus is not technically for free, but you know they're not this one. This could have been a pay per view card right here. You got two title fights on the card right now. Yep. You got Jan Blahovich versus Glover Teixeira for the light heavyweight championship. And you have Peter Jan versus Corey Sandhagen for the UFC interim ban- bantamweight championship. Also on the card, woo, this is stat card. Yes, you got is. Islam Makhachev versus Dan Hooker in light lightweight uh, division. We got Alexander Volkov versus Martian Tybura in the heavyweight division. That's I don't think that one goes the distance. Not we either. got Jing Liang Lee versus Hamza Shamayev, the return of Khabib 2.0. Hey, I don't hey, he 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 this guy was was getting ready to dominate two weight classes. So I'd love to see how he returns. And then we have Magomed Ankala versus Vulcan uh Ozedmir. Uzdemir. Uzdemir. Like this is gonna be oh my god, this is mm-hmm. A great card. Yes. Austin, you tell me what's your thoughts on this card, man. Well, um, well, I wanted to first I wanted to, you know, end the belt, you know, the belt discussion by sending out Usman Nargamado for stay undefeated, playing on the same course Fedor in Russia. And now we go from Usman and Argamado to um to part of um the, the, the Habib's team in Islam Makachev, who in my opinion is Habib two point oh is Islam, more so than Hans the comes at. I can see why you say Hamzat, but Islam is just it seems like this is his time to be to be his time to shine and possibly be a world champion next year. But he's got he's not exactly he's he's going against Dan Hooker, who's one of the better strikers in his weight class. That I mean I wanna see how does Islam respond. Does Islam try to prove he's, he can strike as well? Or he do you know, say say father's plan, grapple, grapple him to death, or you know, grapple him until he can get a submission or a t- or KO, ground and pound. Also, how's Dan Hooker do? Because there he fought the last pay per view in um, late September. Yeah, the last 266. Now he had a quick turnaround. You know, he was still in so much shape. Now he's going against a wrestler, a guy who's a, I mean, a grappler, I should say, not a wrestler, but a grappler. He's got, he's got wrestling. He's really phenomenal. But also can strike too. And, and Islam's got all the hype. How's Dan Hooker? How's he respond? Is he, how, can he set, handle his takedown, the takedowns? Can he keep up with the feet? Can he use his height to his advantage and maybe use his – no, Grant, well, I'll check to the back. He's only two inches taller than Islam, so it's not exactly a big height. That's that's for that's for the, the Colt main event. That's more of the height difference. That's where it's more in play. I'm interested, I'm interested to see in, um, what happens here. Does, does Dan, can Dan Hooker keep, keep on the feet and use his striking, kickboxing and striking to go out there and maybe – and put and it hurt Islam and maybe try, maybe steal the hype from Islam. Or does Islam keep doing his thing and just dominates and win? And then as he ascends to his top, so it looks like a coronation of a world title by next year, potentially. Most definitely, that's going to be very interesting. 
because especially coming off of the loss to Michael Chandler, we saw how frustrated Dan Hooker was with as, as far as like dealing with a, a grappler. And so he requested of the UFC that his last opponent be a grappler. We saw him have a a, a, a better dealing with, I believe it was Nasrat. Um, Nasrat, I forget his last name. Nasrat. I forget his last name. It, it's very hard to pronounce, but Nasrat yeah. is his first name. And he's a very good grappler, and we saw Dan Hooker having success with him. But now you're having a guy who I, I feel has a lot more pressure than um, than Michael Chandler when it comes to grappling and having yeah. the ability to take someone down. And so that would be a, a great matchup for Dan Hooker is can he stuff those takedowns? And can he have the ability to keep that space and keep it to a stand-up game and really strike? And for Islam Makhachev, man, every round starts off on the feet. So you kind of have to do some striking. You can't just abandon it and go straight to wrestling. So with him, can he, can he strike with Dan Hooker at least, you know, not to equate it, but at least give him a fighting chance to advance and go into wrestling. So that's going to be very interesting uh, fight right there and a very interesting progression to see throughout that matchup. To me, the, the, the interest, the, uh, one of the more interesting matchups to me is uh, uh, Peter Yan versus Corey Sandhagen. The the co-main event right there, man. This is this is pressure. This is the same thing. It, it, this is the same thing essentially. But you have a guy in Peter Yan who I believe is a better striker than Islam Makhachev, so he's more willing to do the stand-up game. But you have a guy in Corey Sandhagen who, when it comes to the accuracy and the striking, man. He is up there. He he is top tier in the accuracy and the striking, and he is nasty striking. Like I, this this is, man, this is weird. Like can can Corey Sandhagen deal with the forward pressure? Because he had a tough time dealing with the forward pressure versus T.J. Dillashaw. We saw that that was what kind of made him look like he was fighting a losing battle, even though the numbers at the end of the fight. Made were very close, and some even argued that Corey Sandhagen possibly won that fight, but the judges saw it differently. So can so can Corey Sandhagen find a way to you know deal with a forward pressure a fighter who's coming forward constantly and not uh, consistently making you back up? And another thing for Corey Sandhagen to me, man, is when you're dealing with the striker, he's a long limb. Uh, he's a long limb guy. He's very tall. How do you negate the long kicks? I mean, the leg kicks. How do you negate those to at least give help you help you have more freedom of movement during the later rounds? Because that's going to be very interest. That's going to be very important for him. If he can have that freedom of movement, then I feel like he can introduce more leg kicks later on into the round, and so he's not, uh, you know, trying to look for knockouts doing uh, other type of movements. Uh, the last thing for me for Corey Sandhagen or, or my breakdown of him is I need to see less spinning attacks. If you're going to bring those out, do that. Like, do it rarely. It, it can't be that when you're desperate, you're just going to throw a spinning attack because those can get timed and you can spin yourself into a punch. Or even worse with Peter Yan, man, you can spin yourself into a, a takedown. And if he takes him down... I, I don't like. I think uh, Peter Yan's pressure and just natural ability on down on the ground. I think he's better than T.J. Dillashaw to to a to a degree to where it he's not gonna get that you know he's not gonna get that freedom that T.J. Dillashaw gave him to get back up. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you there. I'm glad you mentioned that because too like he can't be doing spinning stuff. He get time with that. Also taking down Peter Yan when he gets on top. It's very, it's very good on the top. But also, I do want to mention, meant, I mentioned earlier about being a taller fighter. Of course, saying is a much taller fighter than Pierre Yon. He's got at least, uh, excuse me, um, several inches of, of, of height over, uh, excuse me, over um, Pierre Yon. And I do think, I do wonder, can he use that to his advantage, especially with knees and stuff? You know, if he can learn how to fight, if he, if he can learn how to fight tall and just, you know, Outside, just you know, you know, jab and stuff, keep your yawn away from getting close to him. Also, if you throw knees that can possibly, you know, stop uh, stop Pierre Yon's advancement. I wonder if, if we can do that and that can possibly slow down Pierre Yon to the point where 
Jan, you know, gets gets all you know gets a little beat up, and Corey might hit something big that can hurt Jan as well. That's something to think about too. And it's just, and I do like this matchup because they're you know, two elite strikers too. Two, you know, two of the two of the top five top bantamweights in the UFC, maybe the world even. You can think about it. But yeah, and these two and. This is exciting. I mean, this is a fight that we all thought we would see eventually. Because if you remember, leading up to the Jan and Sterling fight, Corey was the number of contender. We all thought Corey would fight the winner of that fight before what happened happened in that fight, obviously. But um, but yeah, the fact that these two guys are fighting now, it's just, I'm excited, man. This is fireworks going to happen. These two, it's this is just in freaking incredible. I can't wait. Saturday Saturday afternoon can't come in, can, can't come enough. Can't can't can't. can't can't um, what's the term? It can't come here fast enough. Just I understand there, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It really can't come here fast enough. I I I agree with you there completely. And uh, another thing I want to I, I I agree with you there. But uh, another point I wanted to uh, commentate on uh, as far as with Corey Sandhagen is, I I think surprisingly, if he can use it like this is a gamble. But most of the times, your best move is a gamble. But I think his best gamble for this fight is the clinch. I think that's where that knee comes into play. We, uh, 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 you know, fighting tall comes into play. If you want to negate the leg kicks, you kind of maybe have to come in closer so he can't kick you. And with coming in closer, you don't want to stay in the range where he's close enough to where he's throwing or he feels close to, uh he feels comfortable enough to shoot on you so you want to be close enough to you got to go in the clinch that's the closest range to where peter yan his power is going to be negated because he's close too close to really you know reach back and throw punches and so with that you have the longer limbs you're going to have the ability to kind of if he can you know, play with the space in the clinch. And I've seen fighters do this, and they're all he, Corey Sandhagen has done this. He he even done he even did this in the uh Frankie Edgar fight. Where he played with the range in the clinch, pulls them in close, then releases them. So now you're playing with the range, you know where you want the fighter to be. If you're pulling in close, you're going for strikes. If you move them away, you're doing something else. You, you're probably throwing the elbow over the top, or you're throwing some uh, you punch, uh, punches and bunches. If you're pulling them close, you're throwing in the knee. And once they want to separate, you release them, and you throw punches and bunches. There's different ways to play with the clinch. He knows how to do this. He's he's a top five bantamweight. And so if he can execute that, I think that might be one of Corey Sanhagen's best friends in that in that fight. Definitely, yeah, that's a good point. Great, great point. Yeah, that can definitely be advantage. The clinch, how that works out, if you can take advantage of that. That's, you know, great points. Also, I do want to mention um, another fight in this card that I do want to mention is um, the return of Hans at Shemayoff. We haven't seen him in over a year. He's he's returning and going against um, Jang Leon, Jang, Jang, Jang Leon Lee in, this, in a welterweight fight. Now, Jang Leon is um, number 11 ranked UFC welterweight, so he's a ranked opponent. First ranked opponent for Hamza Chimaev. I mean, it's, I mean, obviously Jared Mershaw had more experience than um, Jane Liang, but Jane Liang has, has been a much better fighter in terms of success recently than even Mershaw what has been. Jane Liang has about has has won four of his last five fights, and he's got, and I believe he's got thirteen finishes. If I'm mistaken, and Hamza has, has finished all nine of his opponents in his MMA career: six knockouts, three submissions. So I do want I do want I I want to see you know basically someone's getting finished it seems like in this fight. I mean I mean go ahead. Most definitely I agree with you there. Um, coming into this fight, Hamza Shamayev, he um he had he had all the hype and he would have been a bigger name, but he did catch a uh, coronavirus, and it was one of the more severe cases. To the point where he did say he felt like he was going to die. He lost one of his senses. And he said it was hard for him to breathe. And so with that compromised um, position, he did not want to enter the ring. I, understandably so. He wanted to be in the best condition possible. And so he had to have a year off. It, it's all understandable. We want fighters in the best condition. 
And especially for him, you know, he was a guy taking it away from the punches and kicks. You see how severe coronavirus was because this guy, before he caught coronavirus, he was literally dancing between two divisions. He was a guy like most fight we saw with Doughboy Costa, how hard it was for him to make middleweight. And then when it came to the catch weight, he missed that and had to make up another catch weight. So we see fighters, you know, preluding to, to the earlier conversation. There are some fighters who struggle with weight, but Hamza Shemaev was able to make weight for two weight classes. And so I think in him doing that, at least at least had him showing that once in the UFC, that made his cachet good enough to where the UFC was patient. They waited for him. They didn't release him. You, you saw that they released plenty of, of, of talented fighters. A guy in Antonio Arroyo who had a great fight against, um, man, what's his name? Uh, 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 Joaquin Buckley recently. Buckley, yeah. Joaquin Buckley, and that was a fireworks fight. Joaquin Buckley got the better of him via knockout, but we knew that fight wasn't going the distance that one of those guys were going to get knocked out. And so the UFC released Antonio Ahoyo, and he was a, a exciting fighter, but he didn't do what Hamza Shemaev did. What I, what I think was it was more than the punches and the kicks. Being able to make weight, weight for two different divisions – it was it, it's it's something it it shows you can make the commitment mm -hmm. and you're making the commitment twice within a week to fight you're hungry you want the competition and you're willing to make the commitments that's that's all Dana White could ask for of his um of his competitors and he knew how to market himself very well he knew mm -hmm. to be on he knew how to be on certain uh, interview platforms and he's a great interview so you saw how COVID took away that uh, that star from the UFC for a moment, and but now he's back and he has a chance to redeem himself. I don't see this fight going going to the distance. No, nope. I don't. I, I I primarily don't see Hamza Shamayev allowing this fight to go to the distance because, especially coming off of COVID, the one like if it were me, just putting myself in his shoes, I would want to end the fight quicker. Not to say that I'm now trying to burn my gas tank quicker but I don't want to test my gas tank. The one thing I don't want to do in this fight is test my gas tank. That's maybe what Jiang, uh, Jiang, Jiang Liang Li wants to do in this fight but that's not Hamza Shemaev's um, fight style and that shouldn't be his, um, his, his test going into this fight. He shouldn't be wanting to test his gas tank. He's a forward pressure fighter so it, it should be going for the finish. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think they, I, I can understand that they probably should be. And also, and, and yeah, that, yeah, you're right. That you should probably go for the finish and not try to, you know, test his gas tank. And plus, and plus, you know, Jing Liang, I mean, you might want, you might want to. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that um, Jing Liang lost to Neil Magny. Not his last fight, but the second to last fight because he won, because Jing Liang won his last fight. And Neil Magny's a pretty good grappler. Very phenomenal grappler and used his grappling. If I remember that fight, yeah, he used his grappling to win that fight, control Jing Liang and prevent him from, you know, prevent him from, you know, doing his thing. Hamza has a grappling background. I do think if you're Hamza, you may want to use that grappling background against Jing Liang and try, you know, take him down, control him, maybe go for ground and pound, or submission, or things like that, etc. If you in this fight, so that's something that I think we may have to look out for watching this fight on Saturday afternoon here in the East Coast. Most definitely. Um, I, but if if that is Hamzat's approach, do you think maybe he should just stick more? Like, do you think, oh, man. Both of these guys are really good grapplers. Do you think this fight never goes to the ground and both of these guys just stand up and strike? Because that's maybe. usually how it is in, a, in MMA. Because um, I actually saw the press conference they had to net, you know, earlier today or tonight. But, um. They both of them were like, like really like they're like, how like, they're very like staring at each other very intensely, like they like they both want to prove a point against each other. Like Jing Lian wants to take the hype and Hamza wants to destroy him, let him know that hey, I'm that good, I'm still that guy. 
and you could tell, and even even the whenever at the press conference, whenever they were like doing an interview, you know, at, taking questions from the media, they were kind of like, you know, you could tell there was like tension, like they were really like, on each, I guess yeah, there was tension between the two of them. If you go back and watch it with them interrupting each other, well, more so with Hamza. I guess I guess Hamza knows Mandarin because he was speaking Mandarin. And Hamza knew exactly what Jingling was saying, which was like kind of crazy. That's dope. I, I gotta check that out. I, I you know, remember I to uh, full close uh, discretion to the viewers. I it, it's usually my day off today, but I got called in for work, so I missed the um the the interview. So I'll check that out uh, later on. But that's that's interesting to me. That's juicy to me. That already lets me know that uh, now coming off of these press conferences, that neither of these guys plan to grapple each other. That they really want to finish each other off, but. Even then, man, usually in MMA, it, it, if two great wrestlers are facing off against each other, it usually doesn't end on the mat. No, exactly. Two great wrestlers, even great grapplers, it's jiu-jitsu guys, it's stand-up war. Usually, we have the better stand-up wins. Yep. Yeah. Um, another so, point is, go ahead. No, so with that being said, uh, the what, what was the next fight that you wanted to break down? I wanted to break down... Um, the opener of the main event of the main card, which is Magomed and Kalaya versus Volkan Ozdemir. Ozdemir has come out of this KO loss to Yuri Pahaska. Before that, had won two in a row, arguably three, because the split decision loss to Dominic Reyes was controversial at the time. A lot of people thought he won. And then you got Nkalaya, who, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I know he's come off the victory, or I believe I Kutalaiba. Well, let me see if it was that. I think he might fall after I Kutalaba. Yeah, he fought after Iron Kutalaba. He beat uh, Nikita uh, Krylov. Okay, yeah, you're right. Yep. Okay, I was checking right here. In February, he he, did, he beat um, Krylov. Now, Nikolaev has nine nine um, finishes, all knockout TKO. He doesn't go for submissions. And Uzdemir is a knockout guy. And his nickname or his nickname used to be White Rumble because. He, for those of you who don't know, he was training partners with Anthony Rumble Johnson. He was Anthony Rumble's um, number one training partner, if I'm mistaken. And because Rusamir could like, knock a lot of dudes out. And so they both got power in their hands and their fists. It would be interesting to see if, um, who's, if you know, if if who can implement their offense, whether it be Ustamir or Nikolaev, because some people have wondered if Ustamir is still that guy that was when he, Came to UFC on on you know first in the sea, knocking dudes out in a minute or so, and getting a title fight against Daniel Cormier, and also the guy who bounced back after losing to Cormier and Lee Smith, and you know who, who lost that split decision, controversial decision, Dami Reyes. Although you know some say he might show some sign in life because he ended up winning his next two fights, like I mentioned before losing Yuri Proska. and um, but also it's Malcolm and Ankalaev. It's see the Dagestani fire we're all sleeping on because we all talking about Islam, Makachev, and there's Usman and Bellator, and then there's um I forget the other, not 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 Hamza. He's Chechen. He's not Dagestani, but um it's another Dagestani that people are keeping their eyes out. I forget. Askar Askarov. There we go. That's who it was. Uh, yes. Ask, yeah, but Malcolm Ankalaev is and it's a B, of course. It's a B. Guys, uh, can we see him back hopefully soon? But Ant Magomed is the guy that everyone's kind of sleeping on. The guy keeps just winning. The guy only lost once in his career, and that was to Paul Craig. Uh, Paul Craig, who's you know one of the best you know light heavyweights in the world, and you got right now. He's a guy who's also on the rise. But since losing to Paul Craig, he's won. He's won six in a row, and he's looked like and he looks he looks he looks like a guy who will be fighting for the world title possibly soon. You know, like within the end of next year or 2023, possibly. And I do, and I, and I do. Is this wait, is this his coming out party where people finally start recognizing the talent Magomed and Kalaev actually is? Or can Volkan Usamir go back and steal the hype, possibly, and remind people he's still um, Volkan Usamir? Well, what are your thoughts on this fight? I'm about to make a bold prediction right now, ladies right. and gentlemen, for this main card. Don't expect a lot of these fights to go the distance. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. I'm making that bold prediction right now because after you spoke about Magomed 
And when you said he beat uh, Aeon Kutalaba, I just remembered he was the only guy to bully Aeon Kutalaba. Yeah. These guys are coming forward with pressure and they're throwing leather. Ladies and gentlemen, the, this fight is not going the distance. A lot of these fights are not going the distance. And I'm not going to lie, coming like he's coming off of a two-win streak, so I kind of have to favorite uh, Magomed. But, yeah, this fight is not going the distance. No. That's the only thing I can say. It's not going the distance. Yeah, I agree. And, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was interesting to see if it was, you know, who, who finishes each other, what be, who knocks each other out. Because I'll be surprised at the submission because both guys are known for stopping guys with their fists. Not exactly their, you know. Submission grant. Although it could be submission. Watch it be a curveball. Watch it over a curveball and someone gets tapped out. Or choked out. It, Watch it. It could possibly be, man. Someone hey, um remember Vicente Luque versus Michael Chiesa. Yeah. Who would have called out Luque via Dars? Nobody. Who would have called that out? out? <laughs> no one. That shocked me. So anything can happen. It's Matt A. Hey, it, magical things can happen on Saturday night. That, that I mean, well, Saturday after Saturday morning, but magical Saturday, Saturday magic, night in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, Saturday night in Abu Dhabi. Really, more so, uh, I guess Saturday morning for us in, in the United States. But anything can truly happen. Yes, I'm um, definitely. Also, another fight I want to break down is um the heavyweight matchup between Alexander Volkov and Martin Tabora. Tabora's coming off a five-fight win streak where he looked he's looked really well in, in these five fights. He, he seems to, he seems to like finally put it together in these last five fights. I mean, he's really looked you could tell the guy's improved. And through through you know, and, and he wins fights through a lot of different variations by TKO and not knockout or submission. Oh, excuse me. So he can win. So it's not like he's not like oh he's he's typically knockout or typically a submission. It's Combination of both. He has 15 of, 15 of his um 22 victories or um, finishes. Cool, his last two fights. I mean, his last two fights are victories over Greg Hardy and uh, Walt Harris, which were uh, TKO punch, TKO punch, um, victories. And he got Alexander Volkov, who's 33 and 9, who's also got 20, I believe, let me, let me make sure I got this correct. 22, t- 22 finishes, uh, no, excuse me, 22 KO and TKOs, and 25 of his 33 victories. Victories are finishes as well. So they both guys finish their fights. These are two finishers, two Eastern European heavyweights who are finishers. One's Russian Volkov, one's Polish and Tabora. And I have to, it's interesting to see can um what happens? Can Tabora maybe does Tabora decide to stand stand with Alexander Volkov, who's a six seven, usually a tall heavyweight. Although Tabora's not a short guy, I'm not. I don't remember his height necessarily, but Volkov typically taller than a lot of his opponents. Or does does he decide stand stand and trade? You know, not stand and trade, but st- do a stand up fight with um, Volkov, or does he try to get Volkov to the ground, try to finish him there? Well, he's had some recent success in the UFC, but also success with submissions as well. And these are you know, these are the big boys, so it's exciting to see heavyweights fight. Uh, what do you think of this fight, Dan? This is gonna be very interesting. Um, Volkov does have the height advantage, six seven to six three. And Volkov is always going to have the reach advantage. He has an 81, uh, 81 uh, inch reach advantage. So, 81, in- not 81 inch reach advantage, but 81 to 78. So, a three inch reach advantage. Okay. So, he's always, uh, along with being the taller fight- fighter, he's always going to have the reach advantage. Um, Volkov, man, I know people haven't heard of him. Uh, people haven't been hearing his name recently. But, like, that's because his last loss was to Cyril Gaon, who's currently the interim heavyweight champion. He, after that, he had, two, uh, he had two victories. And before that, he had a loss against, I believe... Um, Curtis Blades. Yeah, Curtis Blades, who's currently in the hunt to be a uh, champion. So when you have a guy who's losing to top dogs, but he's not, you know... He's not losing to the scrubs either, and he's putting away guys like Alistair Overeem and making Alistair have his last fight. It kind of lets you know, like... Or he's knocked out Verdum when he was a heavy underdog, when everyone thought Verdum's going to sleepwalk it, you know, destroy him too, back in the day, you know, a couple years ago. Exactly. This is one of those fights where I... 
it, it kind of screams for everyone to say, hey, Martian Tabura is, is you know, he's going to win this fight. He's going to win this fight. But, man, if Volkov is – Volkov is more experienced than this guy. And I think, man, I, you're not fighting Cyril Gaon. You're fighting a guy who's going to rush in and is shorter. Yes. And, and so it's, it's I think Volkov – not skill stand-up game. He is. He's not. He's all right. I, I don't want to say that uh, Marcia Tabora is not skilled in the stand-up game, but here's what I can say: when it comes to striking, I believe Alexander Volkov is way more skilled than Martian Tabora. So if this is gonna stay striking and Martian Tabora has to go to wrestling, then Volkov has to stave off the uh, the, the the shoots. He has to stay away from the, you know, clinch really is his best friend. Keep it high. Move around with your hands. Keep the, uh, keep to the, uh, grab the underarms. Make sure you keep the under grab, uh, the, uh, under grip, uh, head placement, head hips and, uh, you know, head hips and hands, you know, the three H's. And, you know, after that, create space and stick to striking. That's what, that's, that's his, uh, that's his recipe to victory right there. Stick to striking. Right, yes. Stick to striking, avoid takedowns. That's probably Volkov's key to victory. If Tabor, you might want to mix it up, mix it up with, with his all offense to probably get to probably get catch Volkov. If it, yeah, this is a, this is a compelling fight because this is two guys. One of those fight probably stay, you know, establish well not establish himself. Well, it's it's in that title picture, Hans. It's you know it's, they're there with you know De Lewis, the Blades, the um, not gone, but um, Stipe. And I'm freaking forgetting someone else in that weight division. No, it, it it's more so funny because both both guys are trying to establish themselves for similar yet different reasons. Both of them are trying to establish themselves as title contenders, but Volkov is trying to show that hey, I'm not one of these you know guys that are finished, and you can feed me to the younger guys, and you know, I'm a stepping stone for them. And Martian Tabura is trying to say, hey, I'm just not, you know, a one-hit wonder. I have some staying power, and I'm here for the division. To I'm here to last in the division. Gotcha. So both of these guys are, yeah. No picture point. Yeah, so both of these guys are trying to, you know, they're both trying to show that they are title contenders, but for different reasons. Yeah, yeah, it's sure, true, but... uh. Yeah, Volkov, I mean, hopefully for him, he's not that old. He's only 33, so he's a lot of fights, but still, heavyweight division, you can age, you can age, fight well older as an older person than most divisions. But still, I get what you mean. You don't want to be a guy who people think they're done or be used as a stepping stone for these younger guys either. Plus, uh, my thing is, I <sighs> with heavyweight fighters, man, the punishment taken, I think, is way worse. Uh, granted, their bodies are are bigger, but the punishment is still being taken. Like a heavyweight punch is still a heavyweight punch. Yeah, that's true. Guess crazy. Um, Tabor is older than Volkov by two years, at least two, no, two, three years. He's about almost three years. He's older than Volkov, which is crazy considering Volkov's been seemed like he's been more well known. And you got well known MMA heavyweights versus Tybora. Well, Tybora is somewhat known. You know, we fought Derek Lewis that you know a couple years ago, but like recently, where people are starting to get Tybora its love and his flowers and his praise. Most definitely. So, yeah, but like we said, both of these guys are just trying to uh, establish themselves in the title picture. And speaking of title picture, let's get right to the main event, man. Yeah, and, and old, yeah. older fighters too. Most definitely. Oh, yeah. Glover Teixeira, the older fighter, versus Jan Blachowicz, the younger but, you know, Polish power champion. Um, you kicked this off with you kicked this off, Austin. How do you see this going? Well, first of all, before I break it down, I just want to say Glover Teixeira's birthday was yesterday. During the press conference, I think the crowd sang "Happy Birthday" to him to end the press conference to Glover Teixeira, which is kind of like a cool moment. Yeah, let's go with the share. So his, he's, he just turned 42 yet on this past day. 
Too bad against he can't he can't get cake yet because gotta make the wake up first. But still, if once if he wins the title, he all the cake he wants. But yeah, but, most definitely. Yeah, Jan's also thirty eight, so it's rare you see thirty eight forty two in a in a championship fight. Turn the ages, you know. Even though they're, they're the bigger guys who like heavyweight, but still, this is kind of rare. I just I think it's something we should definitely acknowledge and point out because I mean maybe a while before it seems again. It may be, but then again, we I I think maybe we've had this discussion. Me personally, I feel like the advancement of science and the more knowledge that athletes know of how to take care of their body personally, also with them like having more money to access to spend on their body, you get more knowledge of what's going on in your body. I think we're going to see fighters having the ability to extend their prime. I I think that's going to happen. It is going to be in rare cases because I think some fighters are going to be more so be so um so focused on trying to extend it that they don't even do anything with their prime. I, there are a couple of cases to me where I think some fighters right now are a little too patient for their own good. But uh yeah, I, I it, all in all I think the science is helping their bodies extend that. Okay. Okay, so Anyway, going to that good point, just sign. That might, that might be a, that might be something to watch out for. Possibly, maybe you might be on something there. Wait and see. But to the fight itself, this is you know. Um, oh yeah, Islam birthday was this week too. So you got two fighters who had recent birthdays in this card. Anyway, but let's break down the fight. This is interesting. Jan Blachowicz is kind of been very underrated, underappreciated. You know, not someone who goes by the radar, not even respect. And you see, like the Israel fight, everyone finally gave him their, his respect and his credit. He beat Israel Asanya in March, but n- now he's going against the over to share a guy who's been in the UFC lightweight division and top, you know, top five, top eight, top seven guy for like the past, I want to say, eight years. I forgot. He, there's a st- stat that his ranking never went below, I believe, six or seven in his entire standard in the UFC. Which is crazy. Think about how good he is, and but even then, no one thought he was gonna be in this position at forty-two fighting for the world title. Considering, you know, there are a lot of younger guys they and they threw at him, but he passed the test and he beat all of them. You know, the Anthony Smith fight, he was losing the first two rounds, then came back and beat up Smith and finished him that fifth round. Tiago Santos had adversity. He knocked, he dropped him, but he he dropped, he got hurt a couple of times, but came back and beat Tiago Santos. In my opinion, the most impressive fight victory of. Over his career, in my opinion, and this is you know, and here he is fighting for the world title. And now the thing is, Jan's got the Polish power, Polish hammer in his fist. You've seen it before. And knock dudes out, left knock dudes, and hurt guys, and guys, you know, they don't want to deal with that. But the thing with Glover is, he's had, he's been knocked out before. You know, the only person to truly like knock and knock him out was Rumble Johnson in 13 seconds back in 2016. But usually, if you're gonna finish Glover, you gotta keep. You got to just beat him up. You can't just, you know, one punch, that's it, game over, unless you rumble. Glover, you got to, like, you know, punch him, hurt him, damage him. You really, really beat him, really beat him up to take him out. And that's the thing that helped, you know, that's the thing that helped him with the Tiago Santos fight, that he got dropped, but Tiago didn't, you know, wasn't able to, like, keep hurting him, hurting him. Eventually, Glover was able to, you know, come back and win that fight. That's the thing I want to see. What happens when, you know, does Jan keep going? You know, what happens if Jan throws a power punch, but yet Glover still standing? Does, you know, does he, you know Jan keep going? Does he try to do something else? Does he try to grapple with um Glover to share? Because you can make an argument Glover might might be a better grappler maybe than Jan. Oh, Jan does have um several um, submission victories. No, granted, it's been a while since he's done one, but he does have that under his belt. And. Well, also, how Glover's, you know, they're both pretty good stand-up guys, so it's a possibility this might, this could be a stand-up fight, because Glover's got great boxing, great stand-up. I mean, he was, uh, let's not forget, Glover Teixeira was Chuck Liddell's main um, train partner back in the day. People forget that, which is, you know, that says a lot, because, you know, it says how long Glover's been involved in the sport. He was train partners with Chuck Liddell. But, most um, definitely. Yeah, most definitely. It'd be interesting, because Glover, you know, just, you know, how, how does Glover deal with, you know, Jan's power, you know, 
Yan tends to fight like a poor boxing, kickboxing style. Does, does, you know, if you remember last year in Abu Dhabi, Yan body kicks like Anthony, uh, not Anthony, Dominic Reyes, excuse me, were, were vicious. I mean, my my goodness. I mean, you saw like his back and side wall like like bruised up badly. I mean, does does how how does Glover handle that? Does Yan throw that? And how will Han, um, Glover handle that? Those kicks from Yan, because all those kicks and set up a uh, power punch from Yan. And things like that. Hmm. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. And, but like that, I, that kind of lends into my thought process. The way you break it down, I, I agree with you completely. But for me, I, I said um, the best friend for Jan this fight is his stand-up game. He has to keep it standing up. And for Glover, his best friend is uh, wrestling. If he can get through all the power that Jan is uh, dishing out and get a shoot and get a takedown for Jan, I think he can finish Jan on the ground via submission. Um, my only dilemma for uh, Glover was how was he going to get the takedown early? Because you just don't want to have to go through uh, trying to dodge all those punches or eat a few just to get to, uh, you know, a shoot. And you don't want to expand all the energy early trying to get a shoot. And now you're leaving yourself defenseless for the rest of the fight. And you're kind of just trying to get points. But if Jan is throwing those kicks, how many kicks can you comfortably throw against a grappler? Especially the body kicks. How many can you comfortably throw against a grappler until they catch one and go for a leg sweep? And knowing Glover Teixeira, he's wise enough and hip enough and has enough uh, enough experience that he's probably watched the tape and go, all right, if I leave him comfortable enough here and he throws that leg kick, it's all money for me. I can get the mount position easy. And so that's my question to you. It's like, how comfortable do you think Jan is going to be throwing those leg kicks, knowing you have a Glover Teixeira who can catch those and immediately flip the way the, the – uh, the fight is being uh, viewed. Um, he might, you're right. Maybe body kick particularly might be troublesome. Glover can tack, catch them, take down Yawn. That could be trouble for him. But I think if he does late kicks and good late kicks, it, 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 it can neutralize uh, Glover's movement because if, you know, if his legs are hurt, he makes it an easy target for Yawn to throw punches. Yeah, you know, punches and bunches, which can hurt Glover too. So that's something that maybe if he does a late kick instead of body kicks, that could probably working um excuse me john's favor but also if you're glover you, you might want to check those leg kicks as well maybe you know be sure you will do that but um yeah yeah it's i'm trying yeah it's a good point you make you know how if he does body kick yeah, Glover can just catch him and take him down and then then um uh, you see how yon fights off his back because yon does have like several submission victories but it's been a mess as we see him do a submission victory though that's the thing most definitely. So, um, man, how do you have this fight going? This is to me. This is the toughest fight to pick out of all of them. Because uh, to me, this fight because you can make an argument for both guys. I mean, let's see. I mean, I probably like to see Yang get more, you know, more credit, more respect. Because, but it'd also be cool to see Glover to share a forty two become a UFC champion. You know, uh, you know, first time ever. Because if you remember, four, seven years ago, he fought John Jones for the heavyweight title when he was on 25 winning streak. And John Jones just beat dominated him and, and beat him pretty, you know, pretty, beat, you know, beat him pretty good. But uh, yeah, so seven years later, he's getting his second opportunity when no one expected it to. Yeah, I mean, I, it'd be nice to see that. But the, how this, the, to me, this is the toughest fight of all of them to pick. It's this one. And, and along with this main co main event, but yeah, man, the, I, I can't pick a winner for this fight either. I agree with you there, but the one thing I can say is, um, I'm a liar. This is the one fight that I feel like may go the distance. Sweet, you really because I think the co main event might go the distance personally for this one. I I, I'd, I'd have to disagree with you there. I don't think the co-main event goes the distance. Huh. Okay. We'll see. We'll see, Saturday. 
we'll see Saturday which fight goes the distance, which ones don't. I mean, this is, you know, it's a pretty great card. I mean, think about it. This is really, like, excellent top to bottom from opening main card, opening fight the main card to the end, to the main events. You got, you know, you got, you know, older guys, young guys, guys, international fighters. I mean, there's only one, there's a lot of international fighters on this card. There's only one American on this card, which is Sané again. Also, you got, you got, like, five different Russians on this card. From Yan to Islam to Volkov to Hamza and Magomed, five Russians on this card, and you know it's like you know it's, it's kind of like what I've said about Russian takeover MMA. I know I know you know you don't exactly this is sadly like, agree with me, but Russia right now seems to be on a, a high in terms of waves in MMA. I see all five five Russians on this main card. Most definitely. Um, the last fight I want to talk about, just you know, a quick um. A quick tease, uh, just you know, something to look out for. It's gonna be the uh, final fight on the prelim card, going into the main card. It's gonna be uh, Amanda Ribas versus Verna Yanjaroba. Yanjaroba has been very, very impressive in the strawweight division so far. Yeah. I don't see any title contenders coming out of this fight, but for me personally, I think Yanjaroba is going to like. She's just been very impressive, and so. I think this is one of the fights where it's the only female fight on the card, but I think this is one of the fights where it's going to end in fireworks, and one of these ladies is going to end up with a fight of the night bonus. So look out for that. Well, yeah, definitely performance bonus. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, Jenna Riba has 13 submission victories, so she, you know, she's great Brazilian, great Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner from Brazil. She gets on the ground, I mean, during trouble. Yeah, you know, her two losses were to um, Carl Esparza, who's a great, who's a pretty good wrestler, grappler, and uh, Mackenzie Dern, as we know, Mackenzie Dern Jiu Jitsu is elite. I mean, it's one of the best in all MMA, women's MMA. But 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 Verona definitely has good Jiu Jitsu in her own right. And Mena Hibas is a you know coming off you know she's coming off the loss earlier in the year to Marina Rodriguez, you know via TKO, and we see how good Marina Rodriguez actually is. Where she's she, going, she, yeah. Marina goes on to uh headline a UFC card, so right. you, you got to give respect to the fighters and you know who who they lost, who they they're not chumps. Like everyone, everyone who ends up on these cards, they 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 nine times out of ten, you're not losing against a chump, you're kind of losing against someone who's gone on to do something great, right? Exactly. And yeah, Marina's headline two UFC cards, one both for them. Like I said, one fight away from winning world title. But Amanda Hebos going, you know, is 10 2. She was coming off. Before that, she had won about five in a row, including victory over Mackenzie Dern, which, you know, which shows Amanda Hebos is really, is really still an elite fighter. She's ranked number 10, and, and, Gianna, Roba, and Gianna Roba is ranked number 12. So these are two girls who are ranked top 12. Like I said, no one's going to be a title contender to this fight, but they'll be a top 10 contender. They're a step closer to fighting for the world title. And like I said, this is the most competitive women's division in all of MMA. This, you know, well, at least the UFC in, in the major promotions, at least. You know, one, the women's strawweight. So, it's all, so they always bring in the strawweight fighters. I always enjoy watching strawweight fighters because they, they bring it every time. Those are, those are the, that's the, clearly the best division in the UFC women's division. And it's not even close, in my opinion. I agree with you there. So is there any other fight on the prelims that you kind of – want the fans to just you know keep an eye out on we always say it all the time pay attention to the preliminaries that's where your fight of the night is most likely going to come from um uh, yes because there's two fights for different for both the same reasons it's um tair yeah hang on let me let me let me, let me, let me make sure it's a front it's Olambikov. tair on Olambikov against alan uh nascimento and flyweights. Then you got featherweight Ricardo Ramos versus Zabora uh, Zabora uh, took off. The reason why I bring these two fights up is because both guys are coached by um, you know Habib Nurmagomedov and Javier Mendez. If you know, ever since Habib joined Javier Mendez, coaches who, fighters who are coached by Habib and Javier are undefeated this year in UFC and Bellator. So I'm, I'm, I want to see, does that undefeated streak continue this year? Does Javier Mendez and Kobe solidify themselves as coach of the year, you know, with these two victories, with if these two guys were out there win, Zabora and Tahir? 
it, uh, that's something I want to see. And so, and that, and like I said, it's definitely, it'd be pretty cool if that happens. I mean, it just shows that he'll be, you know, great fighter, winning fighter, and now he's, straight, he's doing well as a coach. And also Javier Mendez, although everyone gets, you know, Javier's the head coach in all these fights. Along, It shows that Javier Mendez is still one of the best coaches, probably the greatest coach in MMA history, considering he was having success in the 2000s, you know, Frank Shamrock, and then, you know, then, you know, Rocco, Kenny Velasquez, um, Daniel Cormier. Also, forgot before that, he was having success with Josh Koshak and John Fitch as they fought for the World's Weight titles, both of them. And sort of St. Pierre, and Habib, and now Islam, and now these guys. It's just, you know, it's, it's just great to shout, you know, shout Coach Javier Mendez for just continuing being one of the, probably the, continuing being an elite head coach all these different, all these years, and different fires, and different styles. It's an excellent thing. So, with that being said, man, um, well, what else do you want to, you, what else do you want to talk about? Um, uh, that's right. I already got, um, not, nothing really to talk about, I can think of. Oh, yeah, I do want to mention that uh, I mentioned last week went to AEW. And that was on Saturday here in Orlando. Just a big recap. It was a re- re- recap, recap, excuse me. It was, a, it was a fun show. It was great watching live. It, seats were great. Had a good time. Great crowd was electric. You know, I know I know it was an MMA show, but pro wrestling, you know, just so bring on pro wrestling. Pro wrestling, MMA is roots in pro wrestling, like I said. And, um, Entertaining, you know, the opening match and the main event were, were the highlights of that show. And the crowd was on fire. I mean, it was, it was like an excellent crowd. Same thing this past Wednesday at Dynamite in Boston. Just like Orlando, the crowd was, was just, the crowd's electric, man. Great crowd can make, you know, can make you enjoy a show a lot more than, t- than usually, especially in pro wrestling. Although MMA, you don't exactly need a crowd a good time, but it does help to have a good crowd in MMA as well. It's like pro wrestling. I also want to mention that. And also, I do want to mention, uh, the main card starts time is 2 o'clock Eastern time, living in the East Coast, 11 a.m. Uh, West Pacific time. The reason that is because they're in Abu Dhabi, which has a 7-8 hour time difference ahead of us. That's why this, this um, card starts in the afternoon. For those of you who are wondering why it's in the afternoon, because they're in Abu Dhabi and they have an 7-8 eight, eight, hour um, time zone, 8-7-8 eight, eight hours ahead of us. Also, if you have ESPN+, Plus, you can get it for free. Basically, if you have ESPN Plus, so you want to you want to pay pay for you, and it, it it's, it's this is basically how it feels like to be if you're living it's it's like living in England for BT Sports when they can do the UFC, if you if you live in the UK basically. By the way, shout out BT Sports, their coverage of the UFC is phenomenal over there. It beats, yeah, you know what I'm talking about those, yeah. those promo packages and interviews. Yep. They do a great job over there, BT Sports, and they, for the UK audience of the UFC. But yes, it's. Basically, it's free. You have ESPN Plus. Starts at two o'clock Eastern time. The main card. The prelim fights start around like I want to say noon. Yeah, noon. Mm, well, let's see. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Give me one moment. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's nine fight nine fights in the preliminaries. Okay, nine so. times fifteen. Let's say realistically all five fights go fifteen. Nine times fifteen, that's I don't even have a calculator, I'm sorry. Huh? Not, uh, you froze a little. What, what'd you say? Roughly, no. I'm sorry, Keith. One, 135. Is that? I think it'll be 135. Yeah, roughly 135. Divide that by 60. That's about two, two, two hours and 15 minutes or so. Starts at 10.30. Yeah. It, it seems like the main card will start around one o'clock. Uh, I got it right here. Plan reactions to be, begin at ten thirty a.m. Eastern time zone. That's the, the beginning of the preliminary, the prelims. From the first prelim all the way to um, the main card starts at two o'clock. The main card starts at two. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of yeah. I I didn't add in um the time they take in for like 
showing the promos and things of that nature. And usually, if they're giving this card away for free like this, nine times out of ten, they have a card to pre preview that they're giving away as well. Yeah. That one's going to be on pay-per-view, but they're about to reveal that card. It seems yeah. like they're about to reveal a new card as well. So be on yeah. the lookout for that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, last thing I want to say before we get out of here is I'm going to show it one more time. We have the QR code right there. Oh. Right right here yeah. uh, in the upper corner, you just use your phone, go to the camera, you go to, the, you know, just click on the QR reader. It'll take you right to the site. You get some of this swag, this merch, Bronx Sports Jedi Network swag. Look at that. Nice Obi shirt. Top and Duncan. The picture. The turn of the awesome. Knicks. It lets you know. Got your blue one. We got the Jedi. Oh, damn. We got the Jedi right here. Everything is doing good, man. I got Chef Dan on the back right here. I'm all set, baby. Yeah, I got my own shirt right here, too. You know, wearing one as well. Just want to show support. You know, want some support to us. You know, go Bronx Sports Jedi merch. Buy some merch. We definitely appreciate it. You know, that definitely appreciate you guys watching us and buying the merchandise. And shout out to everybody who's watching us live. And watching us after the videos uh, uploaded, too. Thank you guys for watching us. And, um... You know, and you know, enjoying, you know, watching us, give us likes, and enjoying our content. We truly appreciate it. Like I said, there's a lot of other channels you can listen to, but you guys chose us, and we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Enjoy, guys. Have a good, have a good night. Have a good, have a safe weekend. Yes, and like I said, you can listen to us on audio as well on these plat podcast platforms: Anchor FM, Spotify, Podbean, Podbean, Recent FM, and Buzzsprout as well. Want we'll to give that, you know. So that way, you know, if you're on work or busy, you don't want to drain your battery, you can listen to us here. We, we, we appreciate you guys that, doing that. And and for Chef Dan and for Austin, thank you guys for watching. Have a good night. Look forward to Saturday and look forward to talking to you guys next week. Goodbye.